my name is Jeff Puma. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Association for Manufacturing Excellence, along with our event registration coordinator, Laura Kloninger, who is sort of behind the scenes today, pulling the levers like she's the Wizard of Oz. Um, you know, she, she and I will be moderating today's virtual event, the new employee engagement with Ryan McCarty. Um, Ryan is the co-author of the book, Build a Culture of Good, and the co-founder of Culture of Good, Inc. He is responsible for creating and implementing a culture of good moment, uh, movement at TCC, which is the largest Verizon authorized wireless retailer and has about 3,000 employees and 800 uh, retail locations across the US. At TCC, Ryan spearheaded a community investment effort that resulted in $6 million for those in need. With more than 25 years of leadership experience in non and for profit industry, McCarty has a passion for inspiring employees and customers, igniting positive change in the world, and impacting companies' bottom lines. Before we start, a few housekeeping items. Um, you'll be muted throughout. However, we do encourage you to put your questions into the Q&A box uh, at any time during the presentation at the end. Uh, we'll use some time to answer any questions that come up. Now, I am pleased to introduce Ryan McCarty. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you everyone for jumping on with us today. Thank you, Laura, as well. I uh, feel honored that uh, AME has asked me to be a part of this and is hosting me today. Thank you for jumping on. I know that many of us have been on a lot of these uh, webinars and Zoom calls, and we're spending a lot of time virtually uh, many of us are doing a lot of remote work right now, obviously. I did see something on the internet I wanted to share to kind of break the ice and have some uh, something fun to think about. As, uh, as I saw this on the internet, I thought it was a really good uh, life hack for all the times we're behind a screen and we're in meetings. Um, so uh, what you do is you take a mug just like this and a tea bag. And uh, before we get into all the good stuff about employee engagement, I just want to show you this. I thought it was clever. Uh, so you just uh, cut the string off the tea bag there and uh, grab some tape. <laughs> well, you're all, uh, many of you are uh, obviously in manufacturing, so I'm, 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 I'm building something here so you can see uh, how clever we're getting with our meeting. So you take the uh, tea bag string and you tape it onto the inside of your, your mug. Um, so it always uh, has the look as if you're drinking tea. And for, for uh, this webinar, I'm just going to grab my water here, but you can use your imagination on what you can pour into a, a mug of water with a tea bag hanging off the side of it here. Uh, so anytime you're in your meetings, you could be drinking wine or whatever your drink of choice is. Um, and everyone that is on the call with you assumes you're just drinking hot tea. So there you go. If you get nothing out, else out of the webinar today, you've got a clever way of drinking wine or whatever your drink of choice is during your next work meeting, all right? So awesome, you've already gotten something amazing out of this. So I really do thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us today. We're going to talk about the new employee engagement and um, how to drive extraordinary results by letting your employees bring their souls to work. And work obviously is going to look different in the instance of what we're talking about for all of you that are on here. Uh, but what we want to focus on is what this new employee engagement looks like. So I wanted to share a little bit uh, about uh, where I've begun in terms of looking at employee engagement and doing the work that I've done. Rather than giving you 10 steps toward employee engagement, I'm going to share just the story of uh, what we were able to do as practitioners across 42 states, thousands of employees, uh, very decentralized culture. So you're talking very remote workers, um, not necessarily just those that are behind a, a screen at a coffee shop, but uh, all of those workers, 99% of them work across the country, uh, maybe two or three in different retail locations, 
uh, across 42 states. And so when we think about building employee engagement, we have to think beyond uh, the traditional sense of what employee engagement has looked like, the type of programs that we can add into the business, and really start to get to the heart of what it means to engage with employees. And what I'd like to uh, have you consider as a way to kind of set the, the tone for the rest of this webinar is that we're not looking at just engaging employees, we're looking at engaging humans. Um, so seems like a very obvious thing to say, but <clears throat> when I get into the idea of rehumanizing our business and uh, doing the work of employee engagement and in encouraging our leaders to continue to engage employees currently that we have and also prospective employees, it's really important that we focus um, really uh, in, in, a, in a strong way in terms of the culture that we're building. So Jeff mentioned that I run the culture of good and I've uh, done that work for some time. Some of the things that we're going to discuss today in regard to culture and employee engagement uh, looks like these next few things. So how to engage your employees and members or customers in meaningful ways. Um, providing how to provide compelling reasons for new clients or customers to do business with you. Um, tying that purpose that I'm going to share a uh, real uh, three, three step way of discovering your purpose within your organization, within your business, tying that to your overall strategy and then making the world uh, and the workplace better uh, and uh, also impacting your bottom line in a positive way. So that's what we're going to focus on. So a little bit about me. I spent over 20 years in nonprofit work and then uh, came into uh, corporate America. And what I discovered is that much of what I was doing in nonprofit work translated really well toward engaging that human element of, uh, of business. So when uh, I stepped out of the nonprofit space into the for-profit space, it was an un unexpected transition for me. I had seen most of my life really defined by the type of work that was very missional and purposeful and uh, had a ton of meaning. Uh, so I knew at the end of the day that the work that I had put in uh, mattered, that I had that sense of fulfillment in, in what I was doing. That, that sense of fulfillment was always a driver for me. Uh, from the early age of six years old, uh, I remember having some really uh, defining moments in my life where even at the age of six, I, uh, in, in, a, in a moment in my life that was very defining, uh, my father happened to be a, a heroin addict at the time. I, uh, mother was diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic and uh, eventually took her life and uh, she uh, died from suicide. And so uh, early on for me, I, I started out life with a perspective of uh, looking for what is my life purpose? What is uh, the reason that I went through what I went through and, and, and how was I going to use my life in order to impact the world? in a positive way. And so that's why I ended up in nonprofit work. Felt very meaningful for me, uh, purposeful. And then when I stepped into for-profit uh, business into corporate America and, and, uh, and working with thousands of employees, that same drive toward purpose, that same drive toward meaning and fulfillment in my work uh, was, was still uh, an undercurrent to everything that I was doing. And so I immediately looked for ways to scale the good that I had been doing in the nonprofit space into uh, this business and, and working uh, within that business really taught me a lot. You know, when you go from working with um, mostly volunteers and not having a lot of resource and, and needing to at some point build a business out of this missional nonprofit work. And then you step into uh, for-profit space into the sector of business and you, you discover, or I discovered that, you know, within for-profit work, you know, there's somewhat of a, 
a, a flip flop on the on the nonprofit. So a nonprofit, uh, we're looking for volunteers. Could always use more money, but we originate with that mission, and we originate uh, with purpose, and we look to become profitable or solvent. In the for profit space, obviously, we're all speaking uh, in in this category that we're talking about today. We originate with a business plan for profit, and then eventually we work to become missional. We recognize that um, that the first rule of business is to stay in business, right? Like that if you don't if you don't stay in business, there are no other rules. Uh, but the second part of that rule is uh, not just to stay in business, but to know why. And so for profit organizations could always use more purpose tied to their strategy. So what, what I was able to do is take the philosophy or business practices of, of very missional purposeful work and bring that into for-profit business. And what I began to see immediately uh, at, at the start or onset of doing this work was a tremendous amount of employee engagement. Now, when I say employee engagement, we're talking about the new employee engagement. So the way that I would say that uh, we could define employee engagement of today is that employee fulfillment is the new employee engagement. So without knowing anything about employee engagement or any of that um, concept, uh, I sent out a, a survey when I launched Culture of Good uh, with thousands of employees doing good, working toward making an impact on their local communities, doing more than just volunteering and creating a volunteer program, but really uh, building a culture of good where most of the people were actively involved in it. What we found is that 93% of employees that we were working with found that the work of culture of good specifically, and I'll explain what that looks like here in just a moment, um, that work, 93% of them, the work of Culture of Good gave them a sense of fulfillment in their everyday work, which is really unique because many times employees don't really see a connection between what they do every day and why they do it. <clears throat> now, if you were to ask an employee that works for you, someone on your team, why do you show up to work every day? Obvious, the obvious answers are a paycheck, um, you know, uh, and, and sometimes it just stops there. Uh, but if you were to look back over your life and consider what some of the most fulfilling, rewarding, uh, meaningful moments in your life, I would challenge you to uh, be able to identify some of those moments as, as moments where you were actively engaged in the work that you do. I think it's a really fascinating conversation to start uh, demanding of ourself as leaders to look at our workforce and to ask those questions of ourself and then to say, how do we begin to build a culture within our business that people want to be engaged with? They want that sense of fulfillment. Uh, I was asked uh, right before quarantine, I was in Texas and, and uh, I had just uh, was about to get on stage and someone uh, motioned toward me and they said, I have a question for you. How do we attract the best talent? Like, how do we, how do we find the best talent? And without hesitation, my answer was, you don't find the best talent. The best talent finds you. And I want to explain that because uh, what, what you create in terms of culture is your business differentiator. And I believe that employee engagement is, is really starts and is sustained through employee fulfillment. But employee engagement, this new employee engagement, doesn't start when the person becomes our employee. So employee engagement starts uh, before they're hired as part of recruiting, all the way through the recruiting, the hiring, the onboarding, the training, the development, leadership development. Um, all the way through all of that, uh, engagement is happening through the life of the employee, uh, from before hire all the way through. Uh, but when we start to build a culture that provides permission for our employees to care, uh, to give back, to do good, not only for their community, but also for each other, 
uh, for those that are their peers, coworkers, when we create that culture and build that culture, and, and let me say this, leaders, it really, the culture comes down to the decisions that you make and how your leadership is within your organization. Uh, the health of an organization, the health of an organization's culture is really dependent on the health of its leadership. Uh, so when we talk about employee engagement, when we talk about uh, what it means to be human, what it means to build fulfillment into the culture that we're building, we have to understand that it starts with us. What you embody as a leader with your teams and your leaders of other teams, what they embody as a culture, your employees will embrace. And when we talk about employee fulfillment, we have to start by talking about leadership. Uh, leaders, it's uh, imperative for us to recognize our role and responsibility in building a culture within our organization that affords our employees the opportunity to be engaged. Uh, when we talk about we don't find the best talent, the best talent finds us. Uh, what we're looking for are businesses that have differentiated themselves with their culture and um, are able to tell the story of their business, what they do and why they do it in, compel in so compelling ways that it draws the best talent to want to work for you. And I think this is an interesting conversation. I think in the last Deloitte uh, survey that in the next 10 years within the manufacturing sector, 22% uh, of employees within the manufacturing sector are going to retire within the next 10 years. And so uh, what we're given is a unique opportunity to, um, to really attract the talent to our business. And by doing so, they find us. So they find us on our website, they find us on our about us page. If we were uh, after this webinar, just simply to go on each one of our uh, business sites and underneath the who we are, what we're about, whatever that page is, <clears throat> how pronounced is it within that page? Um, how much of a soul your business has, how much of a heart you have uh, for giving back, for caring, for doing good uh, for the culture that you've built and are building currently. And again, there's no such thing, I, I like to say it this way, there's no such thing as a perfect culture, uh, but yours doesn't have to suck, right? So we don't have to uh, allow our culture to build organically over time. We can be very intentional about how we build that culture. And that is, I believe, at the foremost responsibility of leadership within an organization, as I've, as I've discussed. Uh, so one of the first things I started doing when I brought Culture of Good in as a movement within uh, the business is we started talking about purpose. We started talking about the mission of the company. Uh, we looked at how important it was for that mission or what we called our cause uh, to be tied directly and aligned directly to, to what we did as a core competency as a business. Uh, and we'll discuss how to do this work here in just a moment. I'll give you all the secrets. Uh, so we, we tied purpose and mission directly aligned to the core competency of the business. And then we tied it to the overall corporate strategy and also we connected it to the passions of the employees and the passions of the customers. Um, so hopefully you're taking some notes down because I, I'll, I'll use the slides, but I'm just going to continue to share my thoughts around what this employee engagement looks like. Um, and so when, when we uh, started building the culture of good within the business, we saw that employees were uh, had a desire to uh, know that their work had meaning, that what they were doing in, in terms of their contribution at work uh, was uh, significant. And so over time, what we've discovered in terms of purpose and, and driving the business through uh, a very missional sense of what companies can do 
um, we set up the culture of good to really establish purpose, not as just something that we put on the site, but something that we, uh, it's part of our vocabulary, part of how we uh, talk about the business. Um, it's what's shared to, uh, through social media, through marketing, uh, but it's very authentic and very genuine in terms of wanting to do the right thing for the right reason at the right time. And if there was ever a right time to do the right thing uh, for the right reason, the time is, is right now. Uh, so we're as leaders given a unique opportunity to not just manage uh, our systems, not just manage our teams, uh, not just manage the business, but really go beyond management and get into this understanding of, of leadership. Um, so I've shared, I've shared a few things already, but I wanted to look at uh, these uh, latest stats from a Harris poll uh, later in last year, these came out. And, and here's, here's where we're at in terms of business overall, regardless of what sector or vertical that you're in. 37%, only 37% of employees clearly knew the, the company's purpose. I think that's a significant number uh, because we also know that that's about the same percentage of employees that state that they feel that they're engaged at work. So when I say employee fulfillment is a new employee engagement, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, what is the company's purpose? And we have to get beyond profitability. Again, the first rule of business is to stay in business. But the second part of that rule is to know why you're in business in the first place. And uh, when we think about how many employees don't know the company's purpose, and then we go into how many employees are actually enthusiastic, only 20% are enthusiastic about the purpose. Uh, that 20% see how they can support the purpose. The 15%, only 15% feel like they've been enabled to work toward the purpose. Uh, and that results in a lack of trust within the organization. Only 20% fully trust the company that employs them. Well, why is that? Well, if you don't know the company's purpose to start with, you're not enthused by it because you don't have leadership that inspires you in that purpose. You don't know how you can support it and you don't know how you've been enabled or empowered to even work toward the purpose. There's always a sense of distrust and skepticism within the organization. And when we talk about employee fulfillment as a new employee engagement, uh, we have to start by uh, looking at uh, going beyond management to leadership, but we also have to start looking at how we're building trust within our organization. So employees knowing the company's purpose is tied directly to whether they're engaged tied directly to whether they trust the company and that's where we see that lack of um, the standard understanding of what engagement is and so if we look at these statistics and i know what stats are really difficult to translate because all of our businesses these percentages are going to look a little bit different and we can all obviously assume that our employees are far more engaged than potentially, you know, the next business down the street. Uh, but when we look at this, I think it's significant. And then in the next slide, I want to show you. So if we were to take these stats and we were to translate this into uh, 11 player soccer team. So just imagine all of your employees, regardless of how many you have, um, are made up of 11 players on a soccer team and you're the coach. So you're the lead. And based on these statistics, that's what this means about your soccer team. Only four of your players on your soccer team actually know which goal they're going toward. Two of your employees or two of your soccer players actually care. Two uh, of your players know which position they're supposed to be playing out of 11 Let's be clear, out of 11, two of them know which position they're supposed to be playing. Two of the players believe their efforts on the field can make a difference. And because of that lack of trust, eight of your 11 players would just as likely to be rooting for the other team. Now, I know you want these stats, so we'll send out the deck to everyone afterwards. You can have all of these slides. So what we're looking at is uh, a gap between wanting to engage employees 
and wanting to kind of find the silver bullet that uh, we're able to really be that company that everyone wants to work for, uh, you know, that, that is excited when they go to work, uh, they're happy at the end of the day, they feel fulfilled. All of this has an impact on productivity. It has an impact on your bottom line. But let me tell you this, it has an impact on the well-being and the mental health of your employees. And I think that's a really important thing to say because if we're going to engage with our employees and really give them a sense of fulfillment, we have to recognize that um, we don't, we're not looking to just make employees happy so they'll be more productive. I'm sure many of you heard that. Happier employees are more productive employees. Um, and, and that's certainly, I think there's truth to that. I also believe that more productive employees are by nature happier. Uh, because they know that their contribution matters. But I'll also say that happier employees are healthier employees. And they, if we as leaders see them uh, truly as human beings to engage with, I think it's really important that we start from the understanding that our motivation to learn more about employee engagement uh, certainly has a lot to do with the success of our business and whether we're driving the business toward greater success. But it also gives us an understanding that we want to see happier, more engaged employees because it's better for them. Um, it's, it's certainly better for the business, but it's better for our employees. Uh, so I wanted to show a, a real brief three minute uh, video of a company uh, called Redux, and we work with Redux to build a culture of good within their business. They're a startup just a few years old, and uh, they have uh, around 12 to 15 employees. And as we're building culture of good within their organization, we recognize it, that the culture of good is very uh, scalable in terms of this company that I'm about to show that has, you know, 15 employees. And, and we work with companies that have upwards of 3,000 or more employees. And so uh, the, the good thing about good is that it's scalable. The good thing about uh, having a purpose is that uh, regardless of the size of your business, the size of your organization, uh, when you know why you're in business in the first place, it allows you to lead your employees and give them a sense of pride in their work every day. So uh, without further ado, I'll show you the video of Redux and the work that they're doing with the culture of good. Culture of good is, uh, is, is so nice and so teachable. It's the way people should act and become customers. Institutionalizing the culture of good for women in business. Yes. Um, put me in a position where I feel like I have to find something that's important to me. I was, I guess, a technical member of that team and having the opportunity to come into it and be in that position uh, was great. And I guess to help part of the reason why I'm right here now is it was connection for me to make uh, identify a medical insurance organization and I was very grateful to talk about the benefits that that organization was bringing uh, to people with hearing loss or children with hearing loss and how their efforts really paralleled with what we were doing and helping that community. I mean we started with hey like maybe we could take uh, plastics out of the landfills and make you know disposable water bottles for people who don't have them. Sorry I'm, I'm uh... how we can create I don't know if anybody else can turn the volume up themselves, maybe. Was that better? <laughs> Do you want me to? All right, I'm seeing some on the chat here. Okay. It, it, it got better. I, I can start it over here. Culture of good is. Is that good? It's, it's so nice. And Somebody so on chat, let me know if it's okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Sorry about that. Institutionalizing the culture of good is the way to run a business. Redux um, put me in a position where I felt empowered to find something that was important to me as, I guess, technically a member of the deaf community, having the opportunity to work in an organization that um, has created advice to help hard of hearing people that wear hearing aids. It was a pretty easy connection for me to make, um, to identify a local charitable organization. And I was very grateful to talk about the benefits that that organization was bringing uh, to people with hearing loss or children with hearing loss 
and um, their efforts really parallel with what we were doing a couple months ago. I mean, we started with, hey, like maybe we could take uh, plastics out of the landfills and make you know, disposable water bottles for people who don't have them. And then we landed on how we can create a system to filter out all the toxins and carcinogens from the ocean. Although that's very far-fetched, that's how far it took us. It just led to us coming up with uh, the idea that we can really make an impact, right? And it may start small, but it's going to end up very, very large. And I think that's a really good definition of what culture of good is. It's a really small idea that impacts a huge amount. And that's awesome. And that's awesome. When the culture of good really hit home for me was when I took my son to an Indianapolis downtown cleanup event. He actually asked me just two days ago, hey, remember that time we went to clean things up and we helped people who aren't necessarily being uh, taken care of? I said, yeah, absolutely. He said, when are we going to do it again? And so I just love that it's, you know, it, it's, it's impacting the yeah, home life as well. And, you know, when I am away and I'm working and things like that, being able to take my son with me and teaching him, you know, a value from a moral perspective. Giving back, it's good karma. It's going to come back to you. So uh, helping people through, you know, what we do here is the best thing we can do. I mean, money is one thing, but what we do on a daily basis and helping people and helping society—that's what it's really all about. All right. So uh, apologies on the audio on on some of that. Again, you'll get the entire deck, so you can watch that. Ultimately, what we're doing uh, when we're uh, thinking about employee engagement, we're using this Venn diagram as a way to uh, be a foundation for how we think about how our organizations and our businesses are um, aligned in terms of our employees, our customers, and a cause. So a cause really is interchangeable with the, with a purpose or a mission. Um, so ideally what is taking place is that the internal culture of peer to peer, employee to employee, that we're, that, that's being built. Uh, it's very important that we're uh, building a culture within the business that allows for friendships to be built, uh, for connection to be made, um, but also the connection between employees to customers and including the customer in the culture that we're building. Um, and then again, identifying a cause or a purpose that uh, brings all three together in, in that coast, the co-centric circles, you know, in that sweet spot right in the center of that is what we would call a culture of good. So you can build a culture of good without me, with me, whatever it is, but, but in doing so, you're thinking about what in many times within business is very siloed efforts, employee engagement, uh, customer experience, CSR, or what's uh, termed corporate social responsibility, uh, as you know, putting a lot of um, investment into those three categories, and rather than seeing those as three separate ideas, bringing all those together. So finding your cause and aligning it with the passion of your employees and customers, and then making a promise that you're going to continue to build a, a culture, whatever your culture is, uh, to build that culture based on your values and vision and mission and all of that. But you're gonna include your employees and customers in on that culture. So when we think about culture, when I use that term, I'm referring to how most of your people either feel, believe and behave most of the time. Uh, so culture starts with a feeling, it's very subjective and it leads to a belief and that leads to a behavior, right? So employee engagement is not about getting and, and building a culture of engagement within your business is not about simply getting all the employees to behave a certain way. Uh, if anything, it's, it's, get, you know, it's creating a sense of something special within your business. It's what we would call the soul of your company and allowing your employees to bring their soul to work or their heart to work. So when we talk about culture, we're talking about the heartbeat of your business, the essence of who you are, the DNA of what makes you who you are as a business. And, and hopefully that heartbeat that your business has is felt by your employees and customers as well. So I'm going to go through three questions that I want you to ask yourself, and we don't need to spend time answering those on, on this webinar. 
um, but I want you to spend time answering them yourself and then you can get with your leadership team, your executive team, or the team that you're leading and answer these questions as well. And uh, these three questions are questions that we ask uh, companies to answer and leaders within companies to answer as a way to find your cause or find your purpose, find the mission of your business. So here we go. All right, um, number one, what does your company do and how would you describe that to an eight-year-old? Uh, what does your company do and how would you describe that to an eight-year-old? I'd love to uh, have you answer that and um, give me some ideas on uh, first uh, thoughts that come to mind. I uh, talked to a hotel owner uh, and his answer was, we provide a home away from home. Uh, that's, that's a good example of being able to describe what you do to an eight-year-old. So you're not using business jargon. You're not trying to sound impressive like we always do on our website when we try to, you know, who we are, about us type page. We're just getting right to the bare bones of this is what we do. So if we, um, you know, if we're in pick, pack, and ship, if, you know, it's, it's we deliver stuff to people, right? So we, it has to be very simple, and that's what we're looking for in the first question. Second question that I'm going to have you answer is uh, with unlimited resource. So hypothetically, say that I am Steve Jobs and I meet you on the street and you've just answered that first question. You have it on your t-shirt, right? Uh, we, you know, whatever that answer is. And I, I see it and I'm so inspired by what you do as a business that I tell you, I'm going to give you unlimited resource. <clears throat> Let's Let's not make it totally unlimited. Let's say you have a billion dollars. If you had a billion dollars to start a nonprofit, 501c3, but it had to serve the answer to your first question, it had to serve what you do, and it also had to make the world a better place, then what would you do? What would you begin doing? So we're looking for alignment here, but we want to think really big. We, we want to consider the possibility if if we're you know, in uh, the space to do so, if I had a billion dollars, I remember one answer that I got back was, if I had a billion dollars, I'd start working with a lot of the prison system to convert prisons into universities and security guards at prisons that were, we were able to do that with, be able to bring in life coaches and professors into those prisons and, and really make this a, a nationwide initiative. I thought that's a beautiful thing. Those are really big ideas. So when we're answering this question, we're not looking for something that you feel like you can pull off. Uh, we we want to think really big. And what we do know after the second question is we don't have unlimited resource and we really don't have the time to start a nonprofit. So the next question that I would have you answer uh, is this. With limited resource or with your current resources that you do have, uh, what good could you commit to begin doing right now that serves what you do, right? And so it stays in the same uh, vein of alignment and, and ties right into that first answer. Um, but it looks to use the resources, the employees, the customers, uh, potentially marketing dollars that you have or uh, goods that you have left over. Uh, again, back to the hotel chain owner, he's, he was like, yeah, we've got furniture and, and bedding and, and mattresses and stuff left over. And, and yeah, it would be great if we could partner with a local homeless shelter. We provide a home away from home uh, with a local homeless shelter. Our employees could go deliver the furniture to the homeless shelter, volunteer. I'm like, that's great. When we, when we start to work on our cause, we have to be, uh, we have to be external minded. So we have to think outside of our business and the good that we're going to do in the world. Uh, and then immediately as we start to do that good, commit to continue to do that throughout the year where it's not just a one and done, uh, but it's a continued uh, consistent cadence of doing that throughout the year so that you're actually building culture. Uh, because culture is something that we're gonna be doing uh, a lot of. And we can't shut down the manufacturing line. We can't shut down the offices to go do this. So we have to get real creative with the type of good that we're going to do. And it has to go beyond 
the CEO writing a check to a charity and saying, you know, feel pride in working with us because we give back. Uh, we, would, we would say, go ahead and tear the check up uh, and then give the resources to your employees, pay time off, team experiences in terms of going and giving back and doing good. And then the organization as a whole. And we'll discuss what that looks like uh, here in just a moment. So what we're doing is we're giving employees an opportunity at work to find a sense of calling. Uh, you know, when I talk to someone in, in the medical field, maybe an EMT, or I talk to a teacher uh, at school, someone that is making an impact on others, and I ask them, why do you love your job? Uh, and they inevitably say, well, I, you know, I feel a sense of calling to it. I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, it would be really powerful to build that same type of understanding of work uh, within um, your typical workplace, within a uh, warehouse, within manufacturing, within whatever sector of business that you're in, that you're creating that same sense of calling. And that happens when you allow your employees to bring their passion to work and their contribution. Uh, giving back, you heard in that video, some of the employees that uh, they're, not only were their lives transformed, but their families' lives were transformed too. They'll never forget that. If you want to make an, you know, a customer for a day or keep an employee for a few months, you know, that's, that's where you get into like, you know, just inserting some programs and trying new things. Uh, what, we're, what we're doing within the work that I'm teaching right now is we're taking the good that we're already doing. Uh, the engagement efforts we already have, the good we already do in the community, uh, the way we reach out to new clients and customers and current customers. And we start to think about all of that in one context and fill that full of passion and contribution. And so once we identify what our cause is, we're going to gain, obviously, key stakeholder buy-in. Uh, there's four groups that are important to gain that buy-in from. Uh, we would say key stakeholders, obviously, is your uh, board, uh, your owners. Uh, secondly, would be your leadership. Third would be your employees. And fourth would be your customers. Uh, they're all very key stakeholders in, in your business. <clears throat> and, uh, and so, uh, again, your ownership, your leadership, your employees, and your customers getting their buy-in uh, really takes a commitment to start this work of uh, identifying your cause, number one, which is very helpful going through those questions, and then tying that cause into the business and committing to a very predictable cadence of doing that work throughout the year. So uh, being able to speak to it and sharing why you do what you do as a business is crucial. Um, secondly is building storytelling teams. How are you telling the story of what differentiates you as a business? Uh, how do prospective customers, clients, how do prospective employees, future employees, how do they find your business uh, externally and also internally, having a storytelling team, having a marketing team, maybe it's just one person utilizing who you already have to tell stories of impact and transformation in people's lives, using video. Um, all of this is important, sharing it on social media, you know, when you have a decentralized culture, potentially employees working in remote spaces, it's important for them to feel connected to the bigger sense of why the business, uh, why, they're, why they're working for you in the first place. And so sharing these stories is crucial internally to your employees and then externally to your customers and to the world. Um, and then really rolling that out uh, to middle management and all the staff. And this is the work that we continue to, um, to build for and with companies, uh, but ensuring that that middle management, which is really where culture change takes place and where you can enhance the culture that you have is through that middle management and the influence that they have on their teams. Um, and so uh, what we're looking to do, and, and I'll just uh, go through this last part because I'd like to give a, a few minutes for, for questions. So I'll just roll through this. The three-tiered approach is we have to start thinking about engagement in the new engagement of fulfillment. Um, and we have to think about how it engages individuals, teams, and the, or the enterprise as a whole. 
Uh, so how we do that is through this three-tiered approach called my good, our good, big good. My good, our good, big good is uh, how we think about the good that we're doing internally, so peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, also externally, uh, employee to customer, and then really centers on the cause of the impact that we're having on the world. Uh, so as you, we think about my good, big good, our, our good, big good, we have to think about it, um, how it influences and impacts and engages the workplace and also the world. So, so this, is, this is what that looks like. The big good um, really is the first step in this process. These events um, are larger company-wide activities which rally employees and customers to make a large impact. Um, so, you know, we put on backpack giveaway days. Uh, these type of events take more logistics and preparation, but it's worth it. Um, it's, it's identifying your cause and committing to doing good on a quarterly basis collectively as a whole unit within all of your team. So it's something to rally behind. Uh, it's something that could be done remotely. It doesn't have to be where everybody's arm in arm going out to do this work uh, because it can be shared on social media. Uh, the impact can be shared. So we get creative with this and we do big good together. Um, the our good, uh, then that, that we begin to build off of the big good is very much around an activity that can be taken on by a team. So now we're talking team engagement. Uh, so this could be a leadership team, a re retail sh uh, store, could be a department within your, within your business. So that team then has a little more autonomy to choose how they want to give back and do good. They may be giving back and doing good internally for other teams uh, and having an impact. Maybe it's the marketing team is uh, doing good for the IT team and you're building that sense of community internally and that sense of connection, but also how they want to give back in the world as well. So again, workplace world, workplace world. That's what we're thinking about when we think about employee fulfillment. Uh, so that's the R good. And then uh, lastly is the my good, and this is the individual act of doing good. <clears throat> uh, it usually involves a small task that can be done in a reasonably short period of time. That, that is, um, that our good part is really imperative to building uh, the individual engagement, that individual fulfillment. Uh, it's really sitting down with each employee, and I would encourage you to do this. Just sit down with each employee that's on your team and encourage middle management to do this as well. Is, is first of all, because of everything that's going on, simply asking them how they're doing is important. I think a couple months into the quarantine, I, I read that um, uh, close to 40% of employees stated that no one had called them, that their boss or manager had not called them to ask how they were doing. If we're going to talk employee engagement, I think we have to start there. <laughs> Maybe I should have started our webinar there. Ask each employee how they're doing. Uh, ask about their life. Uh, learn about them, not just professionally, but personally. Um, and, and build that relationship. You know, an employee is not there and a customer is not there simply for a transaction. Uh, this is far more than transactional, it's relational. And it's very important, uh, I know this to be true, uh, to build the business around this idea of employee engagement is really engaging with the individual. If you wanna know uh, what would be the most engaging way to, um, uh, to the most engaging way to interact with an employee, to build that engagement, really asking them is really important you know, how they're doing, what they're passionate about, why they love their job, ways that you as a leader can step in and, and, and support them growing and, and potentially uh, growing bigger than the business possibly or growing in leadership and development, but just really being there for them, I think is really important. So that's the my good, our good, big good, um, three-tiered approach. Again, I'll send this out. If you want more resources, you can find them on cultureofgood.com. And um, my book is available on the website as well for free. You just pay for shipping and handling. I think it's like uh, eight bucks or something. And we'll send out a copy of Build a Culture of Good. At the end of each one of the chapters, there's questions. 
that you can answer yourself or you can sit down with your team and start these conversations that would really benefit uh, your in employees, your customers, and the world and, and really bring about this new idea of employee fulfillment being the new employee engagement. So make sure you go on cultureofgood.com and grab a hold of one of those copies. So, all right, that was a mouthful. I gave you a lot of stuff. That's normally what I teach in a four hour workshop. So we have a few minutes left, I believe. Are there any questions? Jeff, can you jump back on here and, and yep. help me out? All right, awesome. So uh, we don't have any questions yet in the box, but uh, okay. if you would like to ask any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll answer them. Um, and, and while we're waiting for any questions to come in, um, I just want to say I, I love how you've tied um, engagement to fulfillment and purpose. Mm. Uh, you know, I think about the um, business roundtables, statement of purpose of a business, and how that's become a uh, you know mm -hmm. sort of a hot topic last last uh, I believe it was August and yeah. has continued to grow and and it's it's um, appeared in a lot of articles that AME has produced on our website and um, and I've noticed a real tie to um, more, uh, the Gen Z workforce and how yeah. it, as it becomes bigger they have a greater sense of um, uh, purpose in their work and they're mm -hmm. willing to take less pay in order to yeah. work for a company that's more purpose driven. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what uh, can organizations do to, uh, since those folks, the younger part of the workforce is already engaged in that manner uh, and, and excited by purpose, what can you do to inspire specifically the older generations, you know, the Gen Xers who are kind of yeah, on the yeah, sideline yeah, 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 or, yeah, sure. uh, you know, uh, other generations that are in the workforce. Is there a different mindset that you need to uh, be pushing in order to? Um, yeah, sure. So, so my first, my first answer is going to surprise you. I would say no. Okay. Um, and, and here's why. And, and I only know based on what, as a practitioner, right? So there's a lot of experts out there that would say, you know, the Gen Z younger generation, they care more, they want to volunteer more, they insist on it. When I started, uh, when I launched Culture of Good, the early adopters were older. So the ones that grabbed a hold of doing good and very purposeful, meaningful work within the organization uh, were the Gen Xers and, and even older than that, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I, I don't know that it's the younger generation that has a heart to do this work any more than anyone else. Um, I think that would be a really negative thing to say for, you know, the older generation. I think um, when, when we think about uh, the older generation, just the culture of work in general has shifted so much as you were talking about, Jeff. I, I agree with that. It's, it's shifted where the expectation now, because so many companies are um, engaging in this type of work. Um, you know, when, you, when you're going into work now, uh, it's almost preset into a mindset that, um, that this is a part of work. You know, for that older generation that were just going to work, getting a paycheck, getting their work done, you know, they're just, you know, grinding it out. Uh, that's great. But the moment you insert purpose and in doing good work internally and externally within the business, what you'll find, I believe what you'll find is what I've found is that is the older generation, even though they didn't expect it, it's a, it's a welcome surprise within their work. And, and that's why I believe that the early adopters kind of jumped on. So the approach isn't any different. Uh, what you're going to have to do as a company is two things. Um, you're going to have to commit long-term and make the promise that this isn't something that we're just going to do once a year. Um, so that commitment is crucial because some of this work can be met with some skepticism and distrust of why are we doing this? Are we just trying to, you know, are we just trying to salvage our brand? Is it a PR push? Are we doing this for marketing? That type of thing. When you commit to it and it's ongoing, then it becomes cultural. And then you set up that predictable every quarter we're committing to do some type of work, be it big good, our good, my good. We're going to do that work and we're committed to it. And here's what we're all going to collectively do together. All generations buy into that. 
Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in. So oh, awesome. um, uh, the first one, what's the first uh, step that should be taken to promote the culture of good among uh, a team? Get the book. That's an obvious one. And I'm not making any money on these, by the way. We, we, we're, we're trying to spread the messages this way. So I'm not trying to sell you a book. But, but this, is a, this is where we say start. Um, because this, this gives a, a better understanding of, of how to do this. Um, you know, when we work with organizations in terms of building what they do, we, we need to look back over what the company has done in the past and what we can commit to based on that. And how does that align with the work that uh, you want to do and the culture that you want to build moving forward. So we're not looking at doing a huge culture change effort. We're not, you know, we're not gonna turn the company upside down and try to go in a different direction. Uh, the first step is really introducing the concepts of culture of good. Um, what makes up a culture of good? How does it operate within a business? And then how does it tie? So at the end of each of the chapters, the reason those questions are so imperative is my, uh, the co-founder of Culture of Good, Scott Moorhead and I, um, he's the CEO of, of the business that has over 3000 employees and I work directly with him. Uh, we wrote this book together. So he asks questions at the end of each chapter, as do I, and his questions are a little different than mine. And I think that's a good place to start terms of introducing the concepts of culture of good. Secondly, um, you know, we, we have other resources on the website, cultureofgood.com. Uh, you know, there's video modules that are available that explain nine different steps. You can, the nine steps of building a culture of good within your organization. Uh, that's always been available digitally. I, I shot a lot of those videos actually yesterday. So that's going to be on the site soon. Uh, so be looking for that and I can send out some info on social media. So follow us on social media, get the book. Uh, if you don't have eight bucks, I'll send you one <laughs> myself. Just reach out to me. I'll get you one. That's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, so um, how can we create buy-in to the upper management leadership to help create a culture of good? Yeah, um, I think the same thing. I've, I've had, you know, there's, there's no magic to this. There's no, there's no you know, it's with every initiative, one of the greatest obstacles that we face is the obstacle of, of leadership. And so if, if you simply have a leader that um, no matter what you say, you know, in terms of giving back, doing good, how it impacts who we're hiring, who we're, you know, what kind of culture we're building, how productive our employees are, and they still, they still don't get it. You know, we have employees that uh, do one of two things. They hand the book off to their leadership and they, you know, set up a meeting to talk to them about it, or they just start building the culture of good within their team, uh, right? So, so if you're a middle management leader or you're a VP, whatever it is, grab your team and start building a culture of good with your team. And, uh, it's proven. Uh, we, we know this works. We've done the work for seven years and, and we've consistently seen uh, this work. And so if you start this within your team and, uh, and start to build a culture of good for them, then uh, it'll be recognized. People, people will see it. They'll know it. They'll talk about it. Um, you, can't, you can't lose by giving people an opportunity to give back and then talk about how it impacted their life and, and your team. So start with the our good. Uh, if you can't get the, the big good started, start with the our good, kind of a smaller foundation, but still very powerful to start with. Yeah. Um, and so we only have about two minutes left um, and, and we have two questions and they're okay. both related to large corporations or large companies. So um, the first is, have you seen success with large multinational companies launching this type of activity at satellite sites, so not corporate? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm just going to give you the second part too, because I think it does relate. So what's the largest company you've seen this work at yeah. uh, and actually seen a shift? Yeah. Um, well, Ingram Micro, uh, they're globally $42 billion company. So uh, pretty big. Uh, they started uh, the culture of good in the same way they answered the last question. Uh, not in the sense of uh, global um, to start, 
in terms of their entire enterprise, but they started in the division, one of the divisions uh, that has several satellite locations and, and they've seen tremendous success um, because it does two things. It gives that satellite uh, an opportunity to discover purpose, but also connect back to the overall, um, the overall enterprise and, and the good going on collectively together. So the big good takes place between all the satellites as well. So I would say that's the largest company that we've worked with um, and, uh, and seen the most success with Ingram Micro. And if you reach out to them, uh, they would be more than happy to, to share uh, what they've done. On some of my social media, I have some videos of, of their testimonials too. Okay. There, there is actually one more question. I know we're at time now, but if, if you have a moment, um, I don't want to. I'm good. I think it's a really good question. So um, does this method of culture push out bad apples or transform them? Um, yes and yes. <laughs> the, the question is always which came first, the culture or the employee, right? Like if I get enough of the good employees, then I'll have the best culture. And actually, if you start to build a culture, it does weed out people. Um, because again, if employees don't know the purpose, what are they really working toward? And so when you say this is our purpose, everyone's able to say, well, is that, does that share the same values I have? So we've, we've uh, you know, immediately started to see a different influx of better talent coming into the business once we launched Culture of Good. After about, uh, about a year and a half or two years, we started seeing people saying, you know, exactly what you said, Jeff, I took a lower pay to work for you. Um, that's true. That's not just like something someone made up and threw on LinkedIn. That's real. Uh, we, had, we had people give up some pretty substantial salaries to come work and have a sense of purpose with what they did. So um, yeah, it does both. It, it, it will weed out some of the bad apples. Um, because you'll start to see more and more that they just don't fit within the culture that you're building. Uh, but you also, uh, the good with that though, is that you, you have space then to be able to bring in those that are finding you that really appreciate the fact that they're given and afforded that permission. Great, Th thank you um, for your time today. Thanks for the insights, thanks for the little, um, uh, life hack at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> appreciate everything uh, and and you uh, uh, donating your time to AME Absolutely. and to our members um, and, and our participants today. Um, uh, as far as participants are concerned, thank you for joining us as well because uh, um, you know the the participants who attend these events and attend our, our weekly idea exchanges and that sort of thing, it really empowers uh, AME to continue to do the work that we do and to help uh, uh, bring that continuous improvement mindset to the world and to your organizations and, and we appreciate that. Um, we have a number of different events coming up and you can find those all on our website at ame.org slash events and uh, uh, thanks again to Ryan and thanks to everyone who participated today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everyone.